I'm Patrick Short. This is Jeff Kramer. We've known each other since 1983. We started in comedy sports in San Jose in 1987. We were 12 when we met. <laughs> exactly. Hey, we've been sitting for a little bit, and this has been great, but I can feel it in the air. Everybody stand up and stretch real quick. Just stretch your arm. Okay? Yeah? Real quick. And then after you stretched for three more seconds, turn to your neighbor and stretch something of theirs. <laughs> That's awesome. Let's sit down now. Great. For those of you not familiar with comedy sports, we do improv, played as a sporting event. It's very, very fast-paced. Uh, it has teams. There are winners and losers. There's a referee. And uh, we do that on stage. We do that touring. But we also uh, have done this applied work since 1989 when we were forced into it by some people with Apple. They just walked up to us afterwards and said, you need to make us think like you do. What a great opportunity that was. Uh, since then, we've learned some things. So uh, what we're going to do is help you with the first two minutes of your presentation. And these are things that we've learned over the years of doing it, and they work for us. But as Pat and I are fond of saying, your mileage may vary. Uh, <laughs> Awesome. First, know your client. We just had an incredible 15 minutes in that that went way deeper than anything that we could say uh, when we're piling on 10 other concepts. So know your client, do that work, ask the questions. Also, there's an opportunity to use a thing called the internet. Many companies tell you about themselves on the internet. And here's a tip. If you're working for an insurance company and you start talking about life insurance and they're a commercial underwriter, you are dead. <laughs> know what they do. The next step is uh, showing up early. Uh, if you can get into the room ahead of time and have your things set up so that you're already there when they come in, it puts them a little more at ease. Uh, every once in a while it'll happen to me where I'll show up and they're, they've been in this same room all day and I'm just coming in you know, after a series of meetings and they're already there. And sometimes I walk in with my hula hoop and my ball, <laughs> and this happened the last time. I walked in the door, someone saw me and went, oh, God. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Connect improv to their work. I can't top the hula hoop and the ball. <laughs> Connect it to their work. How we do it is this. Again, your mileage may vary. We say this. In our shows, our referee gets a suggestion from the audience turns to the team, challenges them to the game, blows a whistle and says, go. They need to create their product immediately. And within 10 seconds, it better be interesting. And probably in 30 or 45 seconds, it will be funny or we go broke. Does that sound like your product or service in your work environment? And everyone says yes. So connect it to them. So what we also tell them is, we're going to share some insights we have that we've discovered in working with other companies, and we're really interested to find out what you're going to discover today. Then one of the things that I like to do is to, to reassure them right at the beginning that they're not going to have to get up and perform. Ask them what their biggest fear is after death, and most people will say public speaking. So something I'll say early on when I walk in and say, I, I, I'm looking out at all of you, and you're all looking at me with various expressions ranging from mild interest to abject terror. <laughs> and I just reassure them right at the beginning, it, you're going to be doing things in groups. No one's going to have to get up in front of the group all by themselves and act like a toaster or something like that. And then every once in a while, you'll get people that'll say, what if we want to act like a toaster? You know, and you say, that's great. Go right ahead. And they've helped ease everybody else into the session as well. Also, those are the scaredy cats. But also, we've discovered over the years that the stereotype of your worst people in the room are ardent male sports fans. All right? It's a hardened core sort of male gender stereotype thing. Here's how I disarm them. In my opening spiel, I talk about us having a covenant, a basic agreement for that day, and I say that's a concept I stole from Pat Riley, formerly a successful NBA coach for the Europeans, that's basketball. 
And these real sports fans know that I just made a little funny. And they know that I know about sports. And there is a palpable sense in the room suddenly that I am one of them. If I don't feel the palpable sense, I tell them I own a, a share of stock in the Green Bay Packers, and that will usually do it. <laughs> so, you might not be a sports fan, but you need to find a connection to those guys. You do. They're the ones sitting there like this. When we work with school faculties, it's usually the football coaches. Now once, Forest Grove High School in Oregon, we had a football coach who led the way in participation, and I thought, I have found it. Then I found out he was married to the drama teacher. <laughs> uh, you know, part of that covenant that we make with them is we'll tell them that they have the ability to sit out any game or exercise that they want if they feel physically uncomfortable or emotionally uncomfortable or they just don't seem to feel like they want to play it. And we'll say to them right at the beginning, if there's any game you don't want to play, sit out. You don't have to tell us. You don't have to raise your hand and ask us if you can sit out. Just sit out. The only thing we ask of you, and we make it a rule, we say, you can sit out of anything, but you're not allowed to influence anyone else to sit out. And if you sit out a game, you're not allowed to come back in and comment on it later. Ever. Ever. I use the word ever. <laughs> oh, that's good. I'm going to use that next time. Excellent. But I'm going to say it like this. Ever. <laughs> uh, but then we'll say, is that, how does that sound? And 100% of the time they'll say, that sounds great. Cool. People are often really concerned about looking silly or stupid, aren't they? This group is not concerned about that, and it's been so refreshing to hang with everybody. <laughs> but when I'm in front of other groups, I have borrowed a phrase, and later on you can come and ask me who taught it to me, and I will tell you they're here. Uh, I walk up to people and say, if you're feeling silly or stupid, here's a secret. Nobody cares about you. <laughs> right? I hear some shock here, right? But why do I say that? Why is that true? They all care about themselves in that situation. Everybody comes to, Have you ever spilled something on yourself and you're tremendously worried everybody's going to notice? How often do people really notice? Not very often. Nobody cares about you. Nobody cares about you in that way. Take a deep breath. It's true. The sequence of games that we'll choose, and as you heard about uh, before, you know, you'll know the client and customize what sort of sequences and things that we're doing tailored to that specific group of people. But the opening sequence of games, we try not to completely customize it and change it every single time. What, what Pat and I have found is we have a, a few of these games that we call centerpiece games, and we try to open and close with them. We think they're our strongest, and if you have that strong opening sequence, stay with that and make sure that that is strong, and it leads them right into things right away. Just engage them and grab them with your strongest thing. Now, one more comment on that. Know it cold. Hone it. Know it cold. It's like if you go traveling and you have to use somebody else's sound system and something goes wrong. You don't know what to do. We travel with our own sound system, as we've demonstrated. Sometimes we know what to do. And but they're, if they're you making, know those games yeah. cold, you're in great shape. And they're making judgments about you right from the very beginning. So if you say, all right, we're going to start off with um, zip, zap, zap. OK. And the first instinct of them is, well, they don't really seem like they know what they're doing. That first game, they didn't even know. No. So, but speaking of the first game, here's something else that might shock people. I know a lot of people come to this uh, work from theater and from the arts. Um, I will tell you that your best thing to do is to not make people do artsy fartsy stuff in the first game. Slide them down the slippery slope and three hours later they will roll around the floor on each other and do contact improv if you ask them to. But the first game, the first couple of games, keep it simple, don't invade their space, and for crying out loud, if they're touching each other, don't make them do it for long. <laughs> During that first game, you know, we try to side coach them and have them play it, maybe play it again and try it a different way and then ask them, did that improve the game? How? Get them talking immediately and get them thinking that they control this and they control how much fun they're going to have and how much they're going to grow and learn. Awesome. Number 11, we only had 10 things, but number 11, if this fits the client, end on time. <laughs> Five seconds to spare, too. <laughs> <laughs>